Welcome back to Book Club. I feel I've been away for a long time. I hope you all enjoyed the last month um, as much as um, I did when I, I heard the record or saw the recording. Um, this month, oh, we've got a, um, a, a brilliant, very, very, probably the most prolific author we're going to have on this book club, I think. Um, Wayne um, Wissa, who is joining us from, from the UK, but is not really, he's an, another migrant like me, but from the south, southern climes. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But Wayne has written 41 books, visited 77 countries, and is now, how do you say it? A pragmademic. <laughs> pragmademic. Um, pragmademic. 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 Yeah. Who is involved both in the Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership and he's Professor of Integrated Value and he holds the Chair in Sustainable Transformation at Antwerp Management School. So an academic with lots and lots of practical um, experience and usage. He's written, as I said, 41 books from encyclopedias to poetry to fiction, and thankfully also put lots of his thinking and experience into this last book we are reading and or have read, um, Thriving. And I hope you've some of you have had a chance to read it. If not, hey, Taylor. Um, then um, I highly recommend it. There are It is full of not just the thinking, but lots of examples and analysis of things we, um, we're all dealing with every day. So thank you for joining us, Wayne. Um, Good to it, be with you. Yeah, um, and I, yeah, we have a brilliant crowd here. I, across the pond, I think, I can both see UK and US um, and others in between. Um, and we will we'll just start kind of as as normal, I think, where we'll talk a little bit about your background and and why you wrote the book and and how you wrote the book. Because actually, maybe we start there. There's quite a well, a good or a terrifying story that you'd written most of the book, fifty thousand words, I think you said, and then fell foul to tech and lost everything. First of all, um, that ages you, I have to say, because I'm sure that some of the 20 year olds on this or something year olds on this call think that's insane that you could lose anything and they back everything up three times. But how did that feel? <laughs> and, and how is this book different? Yeah, so starting with that, indeed, I'd, I'd written more than half of the book, I would say 50,000 words. It was all backed up to multiple clouds, but all, all connected to the same computer. And um, when I did an upgrade on the computer uh, and deleted it on one device, it deleted it on all the clouds as well. So, um, <laughs> but I do say in the book, uh, I, I reveal this at the end, that, uh, that in a way I had to live the, the philosophy, which is how do you survive and thrive through all kinds of challenges. And I think that I ended up writing a different book, rewriting it, uh, and I think a better book. So sometimes the challenges we face uh, challenge us to do better or to do differently. And um, so I wouldn't recommend it to everyone, but uh, certainly, you know, these, these are things that life throws our way. And I think how the, the book as it turned out was different as I, I ended up including far more stories in the second version. I think probably the first version was extremely um, detailed in its research, but erred a little bit too much towards the academic. And I tried quite hard in the second version to make it far more readable, accessible, more narrative, some personal stories in there and, and lots of examples. And it's, it's certainly full of those. And how do you balance that actually in your, in your, I want to say everyday work and life, this, you know, academia and rigor and research versus the practical? Do you see your practical experiences as just part of the research or how, how, do, how do you balance that out? Yes, I think that is part of a, an approach uh, to, to both academia and practice is, if your starting point is that you want to make an impact and you believe that 
impact needs to be on the ground, then you end up conducting yourself rather differently. So you end up not chasing what in academia we call A-rated journals that hardly anyone reads, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you make some compromises from a pure academic point of view. Uh, and you also end up testing a lot of your ideas, your frameworks, and so on with those in practice. So most of my work is done with companies. And, you know, stress testing some of the ideas to see if they're useful. And uh, if they prove to be useful, then I, you know, I, I take them further. It probably means that practitioners don't fully respect me and academics don't fully respect me because that's what happens with hybrids, you know, you're, you're uh, a, a, a bit of uh, a bit of everything, but it's a path I've chosen and it it, it works for me. That makes sense. Well, maybe we'll do a little poll because I know that there are several academics and several practitioners on this call right now. So maybe we'll, we'll get some comments in the chat or, or do a quick poll of, 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 of respect. I, I yeah, think. Things, you know, because when I started out, I started out in consulting with Capgemini. I was a strategy analyst. And we had this relationship with some really key thought leading academics where they, they fed in ideas and frameworks and, and we sort of. Mm shaped them and, and made them very practical in our consulting work with companies. And I thought, oh, this is great. This must be the standard practice. And then later in my career, I got into academia and I found hmm, not, not really the standard practice. There really is an ivory tower. Uh, and it's all about how academia is incentivized and, and where research funds come from and how they get measured. So in a way, I'm, I'm just uh, back to where I started with that. I felt that was a healthy relationship. Hmm. Maybe can I dig in a little bit to that because so obviously KPMG and, and other of those big consulting companies have made really big commitments to the sort of bolstering their sustainability and ESG practices recently, which partly fills me with joy because it's finally mainstreamed and partly fills me with dread <laughs> for the watering down and, and and those kinds of things how are you seeing that given your particular background it is interesting because i you know i set up kpmg sustainability services in south africa in 1997 i started that and at that stage it wasn't new in kpmg so we we, we feel that it's new because it really has mainstreamed in the last few years, but it's not new at all. So I think that's true of many, uh, many sectors, many consultancies. Uh, Capgemini, when I was with them and I was already interested in sustainability, that was just sort of um, after the Rio Earth Summit, uh, early career for me. And I was passionate about these issues. And for them, it was absolutely not a strategic priority. They just couldn't see how they could make enough money out of it that the market wasn't there for it. And, and maybe they were right. Whereas if you look at them and others uh, like McKinsey now, they're all over it, right? Because mm, the market yeah. is really there. But it, this is part of, um, of mainstreaming and of integration, which, which is key. Unless we can get these things to make sense for those in practice, whether they are consultancies, accounting firms, or, or indeed the companies themselves, we don't get the scale uh, of change that we need. But as soon as we get close to something being mainstream, we have to think about what's the understream, because it's now the understream that has to challenge the mainstream again, mm -hmm. which is partly why you know, this book is, is focused on thriving because I think the mainstream of sustainability and its various der derivations like ESG, CSR, um, definitely have mainstreamed in the last few years, but have been diluted as a result and, and probably don't have the right uh, North Star. I think we're aiming for the wrong thing. Uh, and that's been a, a journey of compromise over the last 35 years. Mm. And that's taken us to where we are today. No, well put. I love that. Bill. Mac I think it's Bill McDonough who I at least heard say it. This idea of sustainability uh, isn't a great word because if you 
um, if you described your marriage as sustainable, nobody would be very excited about it. So why are we excited about it on a planetary level, right? Whereas thriving, I think, is a wonderful word because we all get it intuitively. You can hear it in the word. Yeah. It's yeah. No, ma no matter how much we've tried and, and, and look, we've been quite successful in the sense that, you know, nearly 200 countries have signed up to it as a concept, as a practice, with the sustainable development goals now. Uh, yeah, and, and thousands and thousands of businesses have signed up to, despite all of that, it still is a piece of jargon that nobody can agree on what it really means. And, and that's problematic from a storytelling point of view. One of the biggest failures I think we've had is a communication failure over the last few decades. That's why we still don't yet have the scale uh, and the buy-in that we need, although it's coming. And um, part of it is to do with how, how it's framed and using jargon words like, like sustainability, um, which is just used differently by, by everyone, depending mm. on how they want to use it uh, or how they understand it. Whereas, as you say, thriving, I think everybody gets it. They, yeah. they get what that is and, and why that's a good thing and something to aspire to. No, I, I want to come back to to that progress sustainability has made, but but just before we do that, just so you wrote the book of sort of mid COVID, is that right? I certainly <laughs> started uh, pre pre COVID. Yeah. Um, in fact, it, the whole book was about ten years in in incubation. Um, the the ideas and the f frameworks as they emerged were really following my my last. I would call it, say substantive book which was the age of responsibility where I was trying to get people to think differently about um, CSR and to reframe that as corporate sustainability and responsibility as a kind of CSR 2.0 a transformative concept so and that actually still stands up quite well but it, I very quickly got the idea that uh, despite having also started CSR International uh, and run that for a number of years that that framing just wasn't working. There's too much baggage around CSR. It, it, like sustainability, it's, it's very narrowly defined and understood, still very much associated with philanthropy despite standards like ISO 26000. So I, I just began to play with how, how do we really reframe this? And, and it started with a bit of backcasting for those who know the concept of backcasting rather than forecasting. Like, what is the future we really could agree on that we, we would like? And through various iterations, that's ended up as the, as the six breakthrough areas uh, of, of the six great transitions. So, so yeah, I was, I've been kind of working on it for years and years, um, but really got down to the second writing, I would say, mostly during COVID, yes, which gave a bit of time and space that was helpful. Yeah. Do, does that mean though that that there's there are things you would change now because COVID was such a strange time? Is there anything that you wish you'd put in there or, or wish you hadn't put in? Not at all, actually, because I do reflect on COVID in the in the book yeah. as well, uh, and I and I draw out ten lessons. And I think what COVID did was hold up a mirror to how complex living systems work. I mean, what we saw. We saw uh, exponential growth being demonstrated for us on a daily basis, which is something very hard for us to get our heads around. Usually, yeah, we just don't get this thing of doubling time and how how devastating that can be. And yet, that's what we've had with the great acceleration of of impact over the last uh, couple of decades. So many many things about COVID, I think, help to make the message of thriving. Um, a little more evident so I, I wouldn't have uh, written it differently I, I don't think or changed anything the uh, I suppose what's interesting is so much of the writing that's happened over the years has been giving warnings about crises and and impending sort of collapses mm -hmm. maybe never quite believing that they really will come to pass I mean, I had the same, my first book, uh, Beyond Reasonable Greed, we had very strong warnings. We had Enron and WorldCom just hitting at that time. And we had very strong warnings about global financial crises. 
but again, never quite believing it would happen. And then we've had two, you know, really bad ones since Very then. Fun. Same with pandemics. We have been warning about that for years and the interconnected nature of it. And then it happens. So I think it's a great demonstration that we're not uh, we're not off offline or you know uh, we're we're in the right direction when we're warning about these systemic problems that we face. They they really are real mm. and can be devastating when they happen, but can also see a, a new revolution. Yeah. No. And and one of the one of the many sort of features, I guess, of the book is your other not quite career maybe but your other career as a poet and um you've put in I guess a poem per section of the book or per chapter and I was wondering did you did you a did you write those poems specifically for those chapters or were they things you'd sort of stored up or was that just sort of your personality but also uh in a sense why how, how do you see that interplay between create more creative arts and then and obviously writing of any kind is creative, but the sort of more factual piece. Yeah. Uh, I didn't write most of the poems specifically for the book because I just, I, I write, I have for for uh, the last 35 years or more, just written poetry. And, and it's always about what's going on in, in the world and in my life. And more and more actually it reflects the global challenges that we face but also the movement for solutions and um, uh, some I've, I've written specifically for some elements of the Cambridge course that I run um, the business sustainability and management online course and we have some focus areas and I, I do a cheeky thing as well there where I, when I share my uh, advice for the, for the week, um, you know, I pop in a little poem at the end. So <laughs> I've started doing that also on keynotes to very uh, serious and, you know, executive audiences. And the truth is that mostly people love it um, because it, it uh, accesses a different part of our being. It's not purely rational and, I believe very, very strongly that um, to get people to change, you can't rationalize your way into that change. You have to get people at a, at a heart level, at an emotional level, even at a spiritual level. And the arts help to do that. I actually did, did one book, uh, which was called This Is Tomorrow, where we, we featured the voice of different artists from dance groups to filmmakers to you know musicians, um, poets and, and others on sustainability because I just feel it's, it's absolutely key. So that's very deliberate. Um, I did get to the end of the book and, and it was just about to be approved for publishing and I, and I realized, oh, I haven't written a poem on thriving and this whole book is about <laughs> thriving. So that the, the one that appears at the front, which yes. is which is one called Thriving. Uh, I did, if you like, uh, tailor that one to to the book. But uh, no, it's just a collection of poems that seem to fit the different themes of the chapters. No, that makes sense. And and it, it, I guess, the pandemic. One of the many things it showed was or, or blurred was this personal pro and professional lives, right? And and starting to at least I could see people starting to bring more of their personal lives and their feelings into professional lives because we had to, because that everybody was working from home with pets and children and so on. Um, do you think that will stick? I, I feel like we need it to stick because you do need to take the personal with you if you're going to change the world. Yeah. I think it's definitely had a residual effect and I, and I think it's crucial. Again, I wrote, uh, even in my very first book, you know, that one of the great failings of business is that it more or less expects you to check in your personality at the door, mm -hmm. you know, or your, the, a big part of who you are and just to be this sort of economic machine. Um, and, you know, that, that means that we're not tapping our full potential. We're not bringing our whole selves. And I do see a very strong move towards, whole person learning, but also whole person in the workplace. And um, also, I think some of the challenges we've had with mental well-being in and around COVID and the stresses and so on have meant that we've 
had to face up to the fact that people are human and and uh, have complex lives and they have um, also family lives that they have to take care of. Uh, so what I see is that some of that is is sticking, mm -hmm. um, but it needs constant uh, challenging of the institutions because institutions have a huge amount of inertia uh, and fighting bureaucracy and structure is I think one of the great um, necessities for thriving actually because in nature we get patterns rather than hierarchies and rigid structure and you get emergence happening as a result of relationships but uh, we've gone and designed bureaucracies basically and and then they're, they're not great for um, thriving to emerge and so we we need to challenge them all the time yeah. and 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 presumably so I, I couldn't agree more and and i think everybody who works with me knows that i expect people to turn up themselves uh, quite a lot of the time I see my team members laughing a bit um but the um but presumably that's also a consequence of accepting the particular flavor of capitalism we've been working with for a while right you, you mentioned economic machine or the economic man which has as little to do with a real human being um yeah and really yeah i mean i i majored in economics in my yeah. first degree which was in business and and we learned about through me the free rational utility maximizing individual exactly no i did it too <laughs> which is a fiction right it, it, that that person <laughs> doesn't doesn't exist um so Yes, and that's manifested in, in a version of capitalism that we've bought into um, and it's and been brainwashed into, really. One of the things we, we forget is that, you know, this is a fairly recent phenomenon, this idea of shareholder-driven capitalism and, you know, economics being the driver of everything. Uh, this is something that we've been brainwashed into believing it's a neo, neoliberal idea that was really promoted from, from the 1970s onwards and very much in the interest of those who were benefiting from it. Um, and so we can change that. You know, I, I think that what needs to happen is the social norms change and then the structures adapt. So we, we often get a bit caught up in fighting the structures and banging our heads against uh, the wall, when in fact, if we focus on shifting the social norms, the institutions will adapt uh, to reflect that. And that is happening, um, but uh, there, there are some tough, uh, tough structures still, you know, if you think of the short termism in the financial markets and, and so on. Um, there's a lot of work still to do, but this, the social norms are shifting for sure. Yeah. And, and I guess that um, in it, that feels to me like that's what's happening, that we are exactly in that exponential curve, but it feels very gradual, and but we can see the movement in social norms from all sides, from, from actors in government, as well as um, civil society, as well as companies, you know, people, even CEOs are getting more and more vocal about things needing to change. So suddenly, we're going to have that shift. And I guess that's where you in the book talk about the winner takes all mental attitude, um, that it would suddenly become unacceptable amongst other amongst yeah. other norms, right? Does that sound right to yeah, you? Yeah, and we've seen this many times in history. Uh, I, I have the personal experience of living through the transition from apartheid to democracy in South Africa. And that teaches us a few really key lessons. One is that most of these big changes we need in social systems are generational changes. You know, apartheid was in place for 40 years, you know, fought tooth and nail, many sacrificed their lives. There were campaigns both within the country and internationally. So huge resistance to change. That's absolutely a phenomenon. And actually the closer you get to the tipping point, the, the more violent and the more vocal that resistance is so what we're seeing right now is is actually evidence that we're very close to many tipping points and then when the change happens then it happens very quickly of course within say five years a whole system flips 
And then an interesting ha thing happens, which is all of those who held a certain set of beliefs that were propping up the system or even fighting for that previous system, mm. all of a sudden flip to a new set of social norms. So after apartheid fell and we got democracy, he would really struggle to find anyone who said that they ever supported apartheid. Yeah, because it was simply socially unacceptable and everyone wanted to genuinely be part of a new um, zeitgeist with a, that had swept the nation and a new uh, feeling for you know what we stood for we saw it with smoking as well right smoking yeah. we could ever imagine that uh, you know to that smoke smoking would be socially unacceptable certainly my parents generation if you didn't smoke you were not cool now, if you do, you're sort of, you're, you're definitely, you know, you're shoved out of the door into a smoking cubicle or into the rain to have your, your puff. So um, it's very interesting. And it links to another thing. A colleague did some research on the business case for sustainability, which we oh. endlessly have yeah, to. I've had to you know, yes. <laughs> if we're consultants or managers, or we endlessly have to find this business case. And what he found is it's not really how it happens in practice. What happens is social norms shift. The leaders notice that those social norms are shifting and shift their organizations, often to keep up with what their peers are doing, the competition yeah. especially. Um, and then they find a business case to justify the changes that they made. And so, you know, I think this is very critical for our theory of change if you want to call it that and why i believe so much that focusing on building a movement is is the key rather than necessarily trying to you know rationally argue our way through to to the changes that we need yes no no i, I see that absolutely and i guess the um as you say that the the norms where or the, it's the social norms are changing everywhere and the way to nudge that is then with government signaling stronger either before or after those norms, right? Which is why much as it's disappointing that we're not seeing enough action on some of the commitments made by governments, the fact that they are there as a signal to businesses in particular is helpful. Yeah. I think this is all about understanding how, how change happens and change as you all know is not linear and you get this accumulation in the system uh, of feedback loops, mm -hmm. as the scientists would call them, positive feedback loops. But it means that you don't see the evidence for a long, long time, but all of this is accumulating in the system. It's a bit like a flywheel where every time it goes around, you get extra momentum. And so it was funny when you said, you know, that uh, I can't remember how you framed it, but that we don't see... Or, or that everything seems to be going so slowly uh, and we don't see the evidence for change. I experienced the opposite. And I think maybe it's because I'm really tuned into it and because I'm so old, because I've been in the movement for 35 years. The speed of change we see now oh, yeah. compared to before is, is, really, is really different. And the thing to look out for is which are the things that are acting as these reinforcing um, uh, loops and uh, in the book I write about the underlying principles of scientific principles of thriving one of which is convergence so when you get things that are reinforcing one another you you know that you're heading to a tipping point and and generically we see a number of those so we see the social movements building whether that's climate strike or black lives matter extinction rebellion or me too you know, these are very significant social movements putting pressure. We see technological breakthroughs happening and starting to scale. We see market opportunities that we didn't have before. And we see stronger government policy. None of it is perfect, but it's all reinforcing the other in the direction that we no, want. Absolutely. To and yeah, just to be clear, I see, I see lots of change, but it everywhere it seems to be bubbling rather than powering um, together. I just want to bring in, because Carrie put a note in here, I sort of a little question. So she said, um, agree that bureaucracies are a challenge, but truth is public companies in particular are playing by the rules. So I wonder if the systemic intervention isn't based 
best placed at policy level, such as the SEC here in the US, where incentives can be redesigned. I just want to loop that before we leave that sure. kind of pressure point. And, and I, I am of the belief that we need more rather than less government action. Um, but how do we get that? So they have to feel the pressure. If we can get it right and they create the incentives, that has huge positive ripple effects through the, through the system. Um, but they have to feel the pressure. You know, governments don't lead. Politicians never lead. They will only follow. They'll only give us what they think we want. Um, and so they have to feel that. Um, and, you know, if you get the incentives right, they're very, very powerful. I, I would totally agree with that. It's why we see recently, I don't know if you noticed the uh, campaign of, of um, Sadhguru uh, going around on safe, safe soil, you know, and yes. he did this uh, motorbike ride around yes. Europe and, and so on. And that was really targeted at getting policy change. So it's a huge lever if we can get it. But I would also caution and say we, you know, um, it's ex an extremely brittle and broken system, especially national politics at the moment. And we see far more action uh, at the city level, at the uh, even local level, uh, in coalitions. And so sometimes it's better to just put the pressure there and then wait for the national governments to catch up because we also know cities are accounting for probably 80% of the impacts when you add it up. Yeah, no, I think that's an extremely good point. Um, I wanna circle back because I thought your example of um, apartheid in South Africa was really powerful with reference to this. And I just wonder um, in general, how has, do you think that has A, shaped your worldview, but also sort of maybe more poignantly, the intersection between race and sustainability and racial justice and climate justice there's a lot of conversations around that yet yeah, when i look around and i'm looking around this this virtual room but sustainability and corporate sustainability is still very white so to speak um and i just wonder any thinking do you see any signs of change what do we need to do to to make sure that it's more inclusive what is that intersection at the moment it's definitely a gap and um, it's one we have to work very hard on. From a thriving perspective, of course, we know that systems can only thrive with diversity. So even just starting from that basis, every conversation we have, every change we try to make, every institution we part of, the more we can have diversity, the better. Mm. We're not there yet. I often put up a graph, uh, a survey where the question was asked to countries around the world, citizens, do you want more gender equality and do you want more ethnic diversity? And, you know, you just fall over when you, when you look at the results because there are countries that don't want more gender diversity. And some, even some of these progressive, you know, Northern European, Scandinavian countries who want more gender diversity don't want more ethnic diversity. So... Oh, I, I would we, love to see those stats. <laughs> <I think> we, <laughs> have, mark. <laughs> we, have, we have a way to go, but I do see the movement happening. Uh, you know, I do see voices uh, coming into the room like never before. If you look at COP26, just as one illustrative example, we start to get the indigenous voices in the room. We, we definitely have the young people making their voices heard. And look at what happened with uh, the, the climate strike movement, right, for... For the first year, it was all about Greta Thunberg. And then very, I think, wisely, she started to diversify the leadership of that movement and started to, to bring in, you know, voices from Africa and, and elsewhere. And um, so I do see it it's starting to happen, but we, we have a long way to, to go on that Still a one. long way to go, right? Because, yeah. you know... I, I, I agree. I think that what Greta Thunberg and the and the youth movement have done is is the new kind of leadership, and we have to be really careful. We don't try and um, make hero leaders of some of them, like we have with our generations. But but at the same time, the diversity at at COP was still quite extreme, right? So you have indigenous or or the very young, but there's a whole group in the middle 
um, who have who who are still not, you know, and it's hard. I know we we don't get a lot of diversity in job applications into us, for example, and it's something we talk about and try and reach out in different ways. But it's 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 difficult for everyone. So somehow we need to to shift that. I think the good thing is that it's we're getting incidents and and all kinds of things happening that are just putting it front and center on the agenda. So five years ago, I don't think we were talking about climate justice in the way that we are. I don't think we were talking about social justice. If you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, I have conversations. I'm part of the deans and directors cohort for the Globally Responsible Leadership Initiative. And, mm. you know, we're having conversations with deans, let's say in America, that are having to think about you know, the protests going on on their campus about the statue that they've got and the name of their university, which is actually linked to slavery. And they're having to have these really important, difficult conversations about how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. So that's the starting point is to be having the conversations and bringing, you know, social justice into, uh, into the discussion. Um, I was just talking earlier to, uh, for my thriving podcast to um, Kumi, uh, Kumi Naidu, who was formerly an executive director of Greenpeace as well as Amnesty International. And, you know, he's, he's basically saying the same thing, but I could notice that it's changed because when he was in that executive position at Greenpeace, everyone's mm -hmm. asked him, oh, so now you're shifting from social justice issues to environmental issues. Today, you wouldn't say that. You would just say these are completely intertwined. Yeah. I wanted to also just because there was a leadership question as well, which you've been touching on, and uh, I think Carrie mentioned in the chat about leadership. Does it change uh, what we what we think of as leadership? And I think it it absolutely fundamentally does. Um, in in nature, there are very few leaders. Uh, you know, so in nature we get a lot of emergence. We get a lot of coordinated uh, behavior. And I use the example of the termite colonies uh, where these are very complex social populations and they're doing things like foraging for food, defending the nest, growing mushrooms on the ground, taking out the trash, burying the dead in a cemetery, feeding the queen. She's not the leader, she's just laying eggs. All of this is happening without any leader. Mm -hmm. So by studying that and, and figuring out how that happens, and it happens because of complexity in living systems, we figure out that actually the best kind of leadership, if you like, is distributed leadership. And so it can help to have people in roles that help us to articulate where we're going, what the vision is, what the purpose is. Uh, there's a role for that. But once we know that, we don't have to micromanage people or tell them what to do. Everyone has to figure out wherever they're at, what their sphere of influence is, what action they, they can take, and then it moves together. And some research that was done on applying this idea to social systems, if you take flocking of birds, murmuration, yep. apply that to, to social situation, what would happen if everyone in this room was in a random crowd and uh, you were just told to walk around randomly, stay in contact with each other. Of course, it would nothing. It would be a random crowd. But if I told a number of you beforehand, try to move this crowd in a certain direction, don't tell anyone, but just by your own movement, try to move the crowd. How many people would it take to move the crowd? Well, the, the science on this suggests it's only between 5 and 25%. So a minority that is moving in the same direction can sway a whole collective. And I think that's a really important insight. It's, it's, it's hugely important. And I guess it's some of what's um, at the basis of the Extinction Rebellion movement as well, right? That they know that, that you don't need everyone to be on your side, but if you can move enough, um, I feel like we've, we've, we've so so interesting, and I could we could keep talking, and we and we will. But I wanted just to um, to go to some some of the very specific bits in the book because I can see some questions are coming in that I think we'll cover if we if we kind of go through. And there are two things I wanted just to run through. So you talk about six keys to thriving: um, yeah. complexity, circularity, creativity, coherence 
convergence and continuity. Maybe so if you if you want to put that in the chat, just so it's there. And um, and so I have I have a couple. I have a little bit of a challenge to that one. Um, they all they're all sensible. Um, so one was how how did you come up with those? Was that just living systems theory? Because what I saw when I read that first time, and I've read the book a couple of times now, um, was I feel like love and kindness was missing for me and and <laughs> which which it tells you who I am but and, and I could even do it in C's I realized because you could have had a connectivity and compassion in there so you could have had this eight C's um but so I just wanted to to, to challenge you a little bit on that where where's the love in this yeah it's a great great point maybe we need six C's um <laughs> no it really is based on studying uh, the science of living systems right that's what derives those principles and i've been trying to make sense of those for my whole career mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of make them practically useful because we all know we need systems thinking but how do you make that practically useful so i think these principles help and i mean i could certainly fit in the love probably in multiple of those i mean i think when we talk about complexity in systems terms yeah. what we're talking about is the interrelationships and and i think uh, with that comes the necessity for caring and for love and for uh, those yeah. nurturing, nurturing um, those relationships same with continuity which is really about uh, long-term thinking, multi-generational thinking, and, and that doesn't happen unless we actually care about our children and our children's children. So it's a good challenge. Uh, I think I can uh, I could wedge you it in there. Off. But, uh, <laughs> good. Yeah. Um, I'm expecting some some living systems uh, questions from Adam because I know he spent a lot of time looking at that as well. So Adam, I'm just warning you now. So that that's one of the key sort of parts of the book from you know is these keys to thriving, which I think are, are crucial. And then we have the and you've touched on some of this. You have then the the six kind of great transitions with market opportunities, which gets us to more of the action in a sense. And, and again, um, I'll, I'll, I'll rattle them off, but I would love you to talk to them a little bit more. So you've got, um, you've got the degradation to restoration, depletion to renewal um, in, in nature, um, then disparity to responsibility, disease to revitalization, disconnection, um, like a to rewire to rewire i was like to connection no rewiring and then disruption to resilience uh, and, I, and i really like that actually particularly that's my favorite of of, of those um juxtapositions or, or shifts so i'd love you to chat through because of course they come in sort of two shifts in nature two shifts in society and two shifts in the economy yeah. and um yeah would, would well, you Okay. Sure. I mean, the first thing to say, of course, is they're all interconnected. So this is just a way for us to frame it. Um, and I and I won't talk through them all sort of one by one because we, we don't have the time and maybe it's boring, but I'll, I'll give a few reflections. One is that I noticed on in the nature space that we were getting very caught up in the circular economy, which I think is great. I think actually I did a feature length documentary on the circular economy, the first in the world on, uh, and uh, it's done very well and it's out there on YouTube, it's called Closing the Loop. And I say there, unless we go to circular, it's game over for the planet, it's game over for society. So I absolutely believe wholeheartedly in the circular economy. And that's actually the second transition from going from resource depletion to renewal through a circular economy. But what I noticed is that we were sort of fudging that or even neglecting the ecosystems part, mm. and especially the biodiversity loss part. And in some ways, this is a, at least a, a bit as big a crisis as climate change. It's interlinked, of course, but I mean, this one we're heading over the cliff at a thousand miles an hour and seeming not to slow down at all. So I just wanted to separate that out and say, look, we really need to focus on this one especially as business and i found this working with a lot of businesses they they get circular economy very easily it's linked to waste recycling and so on and then when you say biodiversity and ecosystems they're like 
what's yeah. that got to do with me or yes. my industry That's or my exactly company? exactly what I'm seeing. Exactly that. Yeah. So we've, we've got a lot of work to do there. And I think the first thing is to separate it out and just to say we need real strategies on this. Great that at a UN level, you know, we've, we've got the Convention on Biodiversity and all the negotiations going on there. And we're looking for a Paris climate type agreement for that. And there's some great global goals emerging. So I just think that needs way, way more emphasis. And we need to be really clear on that it relates to every company, every industry. But of course, there are some like agriculture, which are just devastating for, for biodiversity that we have to really address. The other one, uh, I mean, I think the others are obvious, the disparity ones are so the inequalities, social justice, uh, all of that, uh, the health one. On health, I would just say what I wanted to emphasize was since we're all caught up in COVID and you know we've had others before SARS and we've had HIV AIDS and we're sort of left with the impression that communicable diseases are our biggest problem. And, I, you know, it's important to know that 70% of people die from non-communicable diseases. And that's things like heart attacks, strokes, um, you know, diabetes and cancers. And a lot of these are lifestyle related diseases. So 40% of them are preventable. So I think, again, a whole lot more emphasis needs to be on, you know, what is your diet? So are you moving to plant-based? Because actually, if you do, you can cut premature deaths by 20%. Uh, are you living in toxified environments, both in polluted cities, but also with agricultural value chains full of chemicals? All of these things are really vital for health, besides all the great health tech, which is in the book as well. And then... Uh, it struck me that a lot of our discussions, which end up as sort of triple bottom line discussions, a lot of these models and frameworks out there, we somehow technology is just in there, but we don't, we don't focus on it as a force in itself. And there are two elements of it. One is we have a digital divide and it's, it's in some ways still getting wider. You know, we mm. get more people getting connected, but still half the world is not connected. And then you get others storming ahead with the fourth industrial revolution and you know, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, 5G, you name it. Again, making that gap wider, which is an exacerbator of inequality. So I, I just think that it needs a special emphasis, which is why it's separated out. And then you've got the opposite effect in highly developed countries where we get this connected by the technology. So a quarter of all jobs at high risk of automation, another 70% medium risk. And we have to be ready for that. And we have to prepare for that. We have to reskill. We have to move from just thinking about robots to thinking about cobots, how we will actually work together with machines. Um, so that was important. And then the one you mentioned as well, I just found it's not emphasized enough is this issue of resilience. Mm. So we are living in a disrupted world. It will get even more disrupted. Um, and we, part of our strategy for whether you want to call it sustainability or thriving has to be, how do we reduce the risk of those crises happening but then when they happen how do we help people survive and thrive through the crisis and bounce back after the crisis and again this has been something that's been very marginal you know either it's been pushed to business continuity which is mm. a very specialist area which strangely enough never speaks to sustainability or it's you know in the zone of you know aid agencies and disaster relief and actually it should be at the core of what we mean by these transitions to thriving. So again, I, I re really put emphasis on that. And that's where a lot of the climate issues come in, but it's not the only kind of disruption we'll see. No, that's great. And just to, so there are a couple of questions that kind of link to some of these things. So Ran asked um, a little while ago, is diversity essential to thriving? I recall anecdotally that countries like Denmark, which score high on happiness, tends to be more homogenous, yes, i.e. low diversity. Any thoughts? Yeah. yeah, I mean, the answer is, is yes, it is. Uh, it is. And I think that, uh, you know, some of those homogenous societies may be 
happy within themselves, but in the world that we have today where, you know, you can be happy in a world that is, is stable if you've developed a homogenous group and everybody's supporting one another, you have a good government and so on. But in a world of uncertainty and change, that's where diversity comes into play. That's where you de-risk because you have diverse opinions and, and uh, diverse approaches to things. And so I do think those countries are at risk um, from not being, in fact, they're not actually recognized as, as highly innovative um, uh, countries. They've, they've done some things right, obviously, they really look after people. Um, one of the things they've done right, which a lot of people don't know is they, it's back to this whole person. Uh, yeah. So they celebrate um, the arts, so everyone is an amateur artist in, in Scandinavian countries, places like Finland. I read a book once called The Geography of Bliss by a, a self-confessed grumpy journalist who went around the world looking for the happiest places. And <laughs> when he investigated that, that was one of the reasons why they were so happy was they were using the arts. So at a personal level, I think they've done very well. But I mean, we just know from nature that... Um, if you don't have the diversity, you you don't have the resilience in times of change. So you you're very brittle, um, and you don't yeah. have the flexibility. And I think that's that's the danger with all of these homogenous societies. Um, no, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I that everybody being Danish, I don't know that many. Uh, amateur artists in my family and friends there but <laughs> I think the whole person thing is is the right one <laughs> I think they'd be horrified to hear that they were amateur artists um just to come back to that actually the um Sophie put in a question earlier um quoting the book so you mentioned that the as an example and I'm not going to say it right the Atua people of Tazabananda and the need to help them economically regenerate without sacrificing nature and eroding solidarity of their culture. Have you had any further thoughts since writing about how to do this? Now we're getting practical again. Yes, uh, so the Ashwa people and the communities uh, Sapapenza, uh, but it's spelt in a tricky way. So in fact, I've got uh, very recent updates from that because my colleague is still working with them. And it's very interesting because they continue to tread this really hard um, road where they're not prepared to just, you know, go down the path of greed. Their values are so strong. So um, since I wrote the book, even, there have been huge protests that they've made as, as Indigenous peoples against any attempt by the government to extract resources from the Amazon. And so that hasn't gone away. In fact, there've been some pretty bloody conflicts that have happened as a result of that. Um, and yet they, they are still conscious of the fact that they, they need to still improve their social well-being, their development. And in order to do that, they need access to markets. And so that project is ongoing. They're still looking for, um, for ways to, to do that. Uh, you know, at the time we were brainstorming, could they have a, almost a, you know, like a ski lift type situation where they could get things in and out without building a road. What's interesting is they still are convinced um, that building a road is too risky wow. for the culture, for, their, for the environmental destruction. Um, and they're now looking more at, um, at a system of, uh, of flights. Uh, so you get these small planes that fly in and, and could facilitate the, tra the trade. That has its own limited impact. But comparing to a road, you know, once a road gets into the forest, you, you cut down a huge amount of forest around that. So, so that's ongoing, but it's really a struggle for them. And uh, that's the kind of struggle we all need to be engaged in. Where do, where do we make the compromises and where can we really hold on to our principles uh, and get, get what we need economically uh, in terms of development without trading off our social values or our environmental integrity? Yes, 
Um, and presumably, exactly that can only be made by the, by the people there, right? They, yeah. We cannot impose that on them. Um, I just want to jump to, you talked about technology. And one of the things that jumped out at me strongest when I was reading the book was sort of we talk about unintended consequences. And you mentioned one of my favorite examples, Thomas Midgley, the inventor of CFCs and unleaded mm -hmm. gasoline, you know, improving everything and yet causing a hole in the ozone layer and lead poisoning for millions. And I think has been described as the most dangerous organism in the world <laughs> history. But um, you then, um, and I'm gonna read because I wanna quote the book, with, you say that we have to admit that every breakthrough in technology has a dark side. Um, and I was sort of like, yes, that's right. And then you didn't tell us, <laughs> which I was hoping for, how you think we might deal with that dark side, because that's a huge thing. Right now, we're at that point where we're looking for technology to, in part, help us through this normal yeah. challenge. So yeah. I just want to, uh, again, how are we going to get practical on sure. that rather than just go, oh, yeah, there is a dark side, which not many people will acknowledge, either pro or against. So I think that was brilliant. But now what? Yeah. Well, uh, it's true. I mean, there are many examples, right? Artificial intelligence, uh, face recognition software, great technology. We can use it for many things, but it has a racial bias still the moment so the the point is that we have to be um firstly um bringing a perspective of uh, precautionary principles so when we have something that is changing a whole system or you know potentially having huge impact we do need to just pause sometimes and do the extra study or you know just uh, have an ethics committee, for example, to just look, especially at technology. I think um, yeah. we've seen this with Facebook and, and others, so Google, where, you know, when you're pursuing that economic uh, goal, it's very easy to sideline the, the ethics. So I, I think what it's about is being vigilant. Uh, we do need lots of innovation and we do need technology that will help us to to solve the problems. So I'm not an advocate, I'm not a Luddite, you know, I don't wanna prevent all technology. And in fact, on some, I probably disagree with some of my peers, like on, on things around uh, genetic engineering, for example, where for many years in the environmental movement and still quite a lot, uh, it's just like any GMOs are bad. Um, you know, I think it's more nuanced. So I, I don't think we, we should, just be trying to put blocks on everything, but we need to be, you know, doing the extra studies, having oversight committees uh, that, that really think through these at a policy level, bringing the policy controls, because like everything, right, we've got nuclear already, which is potentially, you know, civilization ending, but we've managed to live with it because we've set up the structures. So that's what we do as societies. We set up institutions and procedures and so on. Uh, and that's what we need to do with every new technology. Um, and, and of course, restrain a little bit those galloping horses of, of uh, the profit makers, the profiteers who just want to storm ahead and just uh, you know, go without any, any sort of risk assessment. And the, the bigger point is that it means we have to have this, this agile attitude. We have to be able to constantly adapt. So you try the new technologies, see what the impact is. It's a bit of a lean sort of approach. Once we can detect the impact, adjust. And we've seen this with biofuels as well and the impact that had on food systems. Well, it's not to say that biofuels, we need to throw out all biofuels. In fact, they, they may provide a really... A uh, key solution for um, for the aviation industry, um, but we need to do it differently, and we need to make sure we're not creating biofuels on lands using crops that are replacing food. So we have to keep adjusting in an agile way. I think that's the only way. Yeah, one of the one of the solutions we found, and we've talked a bit about this in, the, in this book club, is using that concept of the three horizons and where we are, and that in the second horizon, we have to experiment and yet make sure that the old system doesn't capture new. So, you know, you talked a lot about 
the companies that just want a profit. You know, funnily enough, I have a lot of friends who've been were early on at Google and all they wanted to do was to change the world for the better. Like, honestly, that's what they thought they were doing, which um, is also quite frightening. Um, you get bright minds doing advertising like that. And um, yeah, I think it also this also links in. And yeah, I may be making myself unpopular. Right? But <laughs> that's good. <laughs> the, the common narrative today is you adults screwed up the world and you should be ashamed of yourselves mm -hmm. and apologizing every day to the young people of the world. Now, in one sense, in a factual sense, that's true. You know, we, we see the trends, we know the data. On the other hand, you know, <laughs> we, we did our best. We have been doing our best. Many of us have been fighting a good fight on many of these issues. We have a generation that was fighting nuclear annihilation. The young people don't even know anything about that because, okay, it's still a risk, but it's not the kind of risk it was when I was young or when my parents were a generation. Um, so every generation has its challenges and, and they rise up and the bigger they get, the more we respond, but there are multiple challenges. And so, you know, that's that's the best we can do. Uh, and so I, I don't think it's very helpful for us to go into that mode of, you know, we screwed everything up and, uh, you know, the young people have all the answers. I think it's, we've made some mistakes, of course. Uh, we've also done some amazing things. We've pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. We've avoided a nuclear uh, meltdown. We've, we've done many things right uh, we actually have if you look at cities more diverse populations than we ever had so um yeah. but then we have to acknowledge and and say okay now what needs to change for us to to really forward yeah, yeah. Uh, i want to come back to that but i want um there's one more comment on the sort of transitions and teen has put in an, a question i'm going to actually ask her to, to read it out because i know she's well behaved she's going to mute herself once she's done it Teen, would you I'm give so glad you think I'm well behaved. Um, okay, <laughs> let me go back to it. All right, so um, yes, thank you so much, Wayne. Uh, amazing book. So, can you talk a little bit more about the concept of synergy, um, which you mentioned in the integration chapter? Um, so I run Rockflower, which is a venture philanthropy fund for women and girls. And um, we have a phrase that we use called the currency of mind, i.e. the value of ideas and relationships. And um, I recently made a 3D model of this ecosystem um, with some polystyrene balls and some pipe cleaners. And, um, and it made me think about the value of the spaces in between. And I'd love to just know how much value you place personally on this idea um, and that of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. And, um, and if I may, and I'll put myself on mute, um, for anyone who watched Blue Peter, we always used to say, and here's one I made earlier. Um, <laughs> I have this, ah, this fantastic. Model. <laughs> yeah. Visualizing. Um, yeah, I think synergy is, is at the heart of all of this. And it's, it is what I tried to get across in the book, which is that the only way we turn these breakdowns into breakthroughs is when we make solutions that are not addressing a single issue. So they, they're solutions, let's say it's a climate solution, which makes us more resilient, but at the same time, it's inclusive. So it's got a social justice element and it improves people's health and it protects people's uh, ecosystems. You know, we need these kind of win-win-win-win-win um, solutions because that's what creates the, um, you know, the positive tipping points, the convergence, uh, the positive feedback loops, because it, it has a positive effect on one of the issues, but then also on the others. I think the problem with a lot of the solutions we've come up with in the past is that they, they've been too focused on solving one issue without taking into account the knock-on effects on the other issues. So maybe it's a brilliant technology that is, a yeah, wonderful, you know, climate solution or food solution, uh, let's say it tackles waste, um, but it's actually terrible for some of the other transitions we're trying to make. You know, it's, let's say it's expensive and so it's exclusive and it creates a whole lot of waste so that we've got the oceans full of plastic and microplastics in our food chain. So it's that kind of solo uh, uh, 
or unitary mono thinking that has got us into trouble. So when I use the framework, um, working with companies, that's actually what we do is we take these six areas of breakthrough and we say, okay, now, whatever your new idea is, your, your great thing that's going to change the world, a new product, a new service, how many of these six is it benefiting? And are there some actually that it's, you know, uh, causing harm to? And I think it's absolutely, absolutely key. But it's a hard thing to, again, for our human brains to try to, to get this complexity and to think in that way. Um, that that's what we need. That that's the real innovation. That's what I call integrated value. You know, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. I love that Blue Peter reference as well. <laughs> that's brilliant. One more comment on that quickly yeah. on on synergy. We also it's not just synergy between the the different transitions. Let's say a nature mm -hmm. element and a health element and a yeah. technology element. It's also synergy between the levels of the system. So the problem is what we've done, all systems are nested, as you know, and what we've been doing is optimizing at a certain level, but then there's no synergy, right. there's no positive impact on the next level, and especially of the system that it's a part of. And so we've ended up eroding the systems that we're a part of. Uh, and so it needs to be synergy in that way as well. Great. I hope that gave you an answer, Tim. Um, just gave me the chance to just look in the in the chat a little bit. And there's a couple of comments around um, this unintended consequences. And for example, the IEEE in the US who are doing a lot of work and a couple of other organizations on how do you implement that ethics and the unintended consequence. What we'll do is we'll make sure we send out the chat to all of them because there's lots of links and resources and so on. Um, so there's a huge theme going through your book that we haven't actually, we've touched on it very slightly, and it's this optimism, um, uh, or we could call it the, I think it's the paradox of what's going on at the moment. So on one hand, we have to, I believe, be optimistic in order to act. We can't act from fear and despair in, in, a, in a sensible way. Um, but also there's this paradox through it. And you, you talk a lot about being, you know, the importance of being optimistic, but of improving the average, for example, whilst increasing disparity. And, and sometimes it just feels like, in the Factfulness book um, by Hans Rosling, which on one hand was a fantastic book, but it also to me had that sense of, well, is it just us optimists? And I'm definitely one of them trying to cheer ourselves up and get others to keep going. Is it not directly contrasting, and I'm gonna go back to Greta Thunberg, um, her plea for us to panic and act like our house is on fire. You know, there's, there's something there that's really interesting. And a lot of sustainability professionals are now deeply disillusioned. We're seeing, I feel like on a monthly basis, very powerful articles about people who've spent decades trying to do the right thing and who are saying, well, actually, this is almost more dangerous to pretend that it, that there is progress that we have this illusion of progress but actually yeah it isn't there so i just i'd love to chat to you a little bit about some of, of those things it's a crucial idea and the first thing i would say is that i would distinguish between um optimism as a choice and optimism as denial so we're not talking about blind optimism. We're not talking about optimism based on the idea that the world is all wonderful and everything's going to be better. In fact, it's more the kind of um, situation like the Stockdale paradox named after the Naval uh, mm -hmm. Admiral who said, you have to face the brutal reality. He survived the Vietnamese uh, prisoner of war camps, uh, faced that brutal reality, but then never give up the faith or the hope or the belief that things can get better. And both hope and optimism are totally grounded in action. I think without the action, it is delusion. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I sometimes steer away a little bit from op the word optimism because it has all of those, uh, mm. those sort of misinterpretations. But I do have 
you won't be surprised, and a, a poem called Be an Optimist. And I won't read it all, but it, it starts like this. It says, be an optimist, not because the future is bright, but because bright people are working to make the future better. Be an optimist, not because the news is good, but because good people are showing that change is always possible. Be an optimist, not because the world is fair, but because fair people are fighting for justice wherever it is needed. And it goes on. So optimism is a choice and it's a mindset. It's a way of being in the world that is more effective. And it means, uh, and, and it's the same with hope. It means that you choose to have this perspective because it gives you the best chance of being an effective change agent. Um, otherwise, you, you, you're simply disempowering yourself and everyone else. Um, and I'm always reminded also of Viktor Frankl, uh, Austrian psychiatrist who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. He survived four Nazi concentration camps. And he talks about the fact that even in those most dire of situations, you always have a choice. And the choice that ultimately you have is over your attitude. Yeah. And so optimism and hope uh, and faith, if you like, these are attitudes, ways of being in the world but they shouldn't be conveyed in a way that breeds complacency. It's, it's actually the opposite. It's like our hope and our optimism is grounded on the fact that we know how much there is to do and we know that we need everyone acting urgently, but we realize we're part of a movement. So that's the second perspective I wanna bring is my main reasons for optimism and hope is through an understanding of how change happens. And I think why a lot of people get into despair is because they assume that firstly, what they see is how it will always be, or that the trends as they see them will continue in the same direction forever, or that uh, change is linear and it's not. And so understanding these phenomena like tipping points, like the fact that you get lots of resistance and then you can get a, a whole system flipping and seeing evidence of that, you know, that's what gives me the hope and the optimism because on many issues, not all, but on many issues, I see that. And at the end of the day, we are an amazing species that just is able to continuously, you know, turn even the worst things into something you know better and to bounce back from tragedy from crisis to continue yeah. to look for better solutions and to build the better absolutely way. absolutely and i think anybody in this field and you know has had to make a decision to be an optimist at least most mornings <laughs> um and somebody quoted the um stubborn optimism of christiana figueres and i totally subscribe to that but i guess I guess the the danger is not with us being optimistic or I think because we think we have to take that that role but um we had uh, Rebecca Willis in um in book club a few months back and she talked about um, her, sort of the scientific background of this feel good fallacy that um if we focus too much on the positive win win aspect of climate like renewables create green jobs etc but we don't address some of the harder parts um that actually causes more issues than not. And I think the Stockdale um, example is perfect because you have to face it. Um, and the where is that, I guess, the balance between facing it and just becoming a little bit of a, of a distraction um, from, from making some of those choices. I remember, was it John Kerry just before, was it just before COP26? He said something like, oh yes, and nothing has to change in the American way of life. And <laughs> I think, well, that's not necessarily particularly helpful. It's a very political thing to say, of course, because yeah. that's acceptable. Well, but, but, the, uh, the hope yeah. in that is that politicians are renewable resources uh, <laughs> and recyclable resources. Um, no, but I, I get your point and, and it can be dangerous in the way that it's interpreted, but um, you know, I, I just think it's, um, there are so many things that need to be amplified and scaled right now. And one of the ways that we do that is by focusing on them and connecting them and, and helping people to realize that 
um, you, they don't have to change the world. In fact, they can't change the world. They can only change their world. And, and because we're a complex interconnected system, if everybody changes their world, and I'm not just talking about individually, but through their organizations, uh-huh. through their work, through their choices, this adds up in the system. And, you know, we, we start to get those uh, positive tipping points. But it's a fight every step of the way. And every time we see some values that are being neglected or th- institutions that are going wrong, you know, that's the call to action. Um, and the fact that it does get us to, to respond and we find others in that place is, again, the, the reason for optimism. It's, it's that they're... It's not that everybody's just sitting back and saying, hey, everything's fine. They're not. Um, And by the way, I did an analysis of COP26 using the six keys to thriving. Oh, fantastic. There's a little article on that. And because coming out of that, everyone said it's a failure. And actually, again, if you look at the underlying principles, has it moved us in that right direction of thriving? Absolutely. On, On almost maybe five out of the six counts of the six, the six keys. So it's seeing the world through that lens as well. You know, always asking, have we increased the creativity or the diversity? Have we increased the connections or the mm-hmm. complexity? Oh. Have we increased, you know, the convergence? Uh, have we, and you could go through them all. Yes. Oh, that's brilliant. Because to be honest, that was my takeaway from COP was that, yes, of course that, particular process failed on on some of the counts in in terms of um what people were hoping for but we kind of knew that going in and yet (laughs) and yet there were a lot of positives in the mainstreaming in in all those things so i'm going to look for your thank you yeah that's great um and actually that leads us a little bit back to i saw that valentina put in a question a, a while back that we haven't touched it was when we were talking about social norms shifting and I guess and Dan is referring to it here as sort of is it the aggregation of marginal gains and Valentina's was how far are we from these social norms to shift still many people are aware of issues but don't care or don't take action or in the best case they're not able to believe the actions of each one of us can make a difference so yeah, that idea of aggregation. I think it, it, it does vary by issues. So some issues we have further to go than others. Um, for example, on, on gender, we, we sort of think we've got that one sorted when we know from the, from the research that we absolutely don't. You know, it'll take more than 260 years to close the gender pay gap on current trends. So some issues I think, um, you know, we have at an intellectual level absorbed that this is what it needs to be. We need an equal society on gender, but there's uh, s- still a, a lot of work to, to do. On, on others, I always look for the, what are the signs that you see in society? And the signs of shifting norms is who becomes the outcast in a way? Again, having lived through the South African situation, we were the pariah of the world, rightly so for for decades and that that you feel that pressure and it wears you down um, and we are humans who are collective animals we're social animals and we don't like to be the outcast and so when you get for example the UN Secretary General you know saying to oil and gas that they've got their you know um, their foot on the throat of humanity You know, those kinds of statements. Now, it's not to say that oil and gas will disappear, but it's a very clear messaging that there's a different set of norms here. We just, there are some things we no longer are happy to accept. We find them uncomfortable or even, you know, um, catastrophically unacceptable. And the more that we see that kind of messaging, the more the social norms are shifting. So, it, it varies and we get, you know, two steps forward, one step back. If you look at something like LGBTQ rights, but on all of these issues, I think when you get the one step back, it's because the resistance is hardest when the threat is of change is the largest. Yes. The same with Russia, right? Russia, Ukraine. 
I mean, at one level, you know, I think Putin has realized he's got an, a whole economy that is based in an industry that the world is shifting away from. So, of course, you would want to do something to, you know, really uh, protect that and, and artificially even uh, boost that in the short term. And but but then you stand back and you say, but has this is this a sign of shifting social norms? Well, the fact that oil and gas has become a security issue now and 19 of Europe's countries have increased their renewables targets since the Putin war suggests again that, you know, on some issues, uh, the, yeah. um, the norms are that. shifting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, again, I think it's Tim Smith of the Eden Project who, who talks about it uh, has a national uh, sort of nature analogy to that, that trees bloom just best just before they're about to die. And, and um, but yeah. he uses it exactly with that, that that yeah. last burst of energy from the old system that we're seeing, which is yeah. horrible to be in the situation. But actually, it's a good sign, exactly as you say, that the the resistance is hardening before it will hopefully fall away. And, and some are at a much earlier stage, right? So if I look at animal welfare, um, I think, unfortunately, although the, the trend to plant-based and alternative protein is, is going like a rocket, to be honest, that's going extremely fast. But if I think about what proportion of the world has a genuine empathy for for animals and really understands the, their sentience and the fact that they, you know, are complex organisms that feel pain and, and so on versus treated like livestock or like a factory. I think there we've got still a long way to go. And it, we see the signs again and the signs get stronger and stronger. Um, so some are at earlier stages than others. Right. And I'm looking at time suddenly. We're almost at time that's gone much quicker than normal for me, at least. Um, thank you. Um, we did speak, though, about whether we could get you to, to, to read a little bit of a poem, maybe. I had, I had one suggestion, but I would let you choose. Um, I just know that this group, and maybe, maybe we'll preamble it, that normally I ask, so what, what is the action or what is the being that you might recommend to a group of change makers? like this and we've had a brilliant very wide discussion yes uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to to do that of course uh, i know that you suggested maybe the um leader the the Please. to lead poem um and um I'm, I'm more than happy to do that um let me just Let me just get that up. Oh, yeah, and I can see Avaro in the meantime has um, has posted a link to a survey. And it would be great if you just click on that link in the chat and it will take the most two minutes to just fill in, to tell us what you thought and what we can do better. And who could possibly follow in, in Wayne's footsteps? Mm -hmm. um... Yeah, so so I've got one called To Lead, which is the one you were referring to. It, it, uh, it's a bit longer, but I'll just uh, maybe do the last stanza. To lead or not to lead? The question's quite absurd. For leadership's the path that freed the slaves, and we need so much more from shore to shore, where chains remain and oceans rise, yet leaders' lies support charades and barricades that cling to glories of the past rise up new leaders who can shape a future that is built to last. There we go. Thank you. That was a call to action for everyone. Thank you so much, Wayne. What a conversation. I think we covered just about everybody's questions. If not, drop me a note in the chat. Um, really interesting um, questions in particular. Um, answers from, from you, Wayne, and your thoughtfulness. And, and examples, that mix of practicality and and your framework and knowledge is incredible. Well, Thank thanks. You. It's it's a pleasure to be here. I always feel I under under cook, uh, especially the examples, right? Because in the book there are literally hundreds of innovation examples. But 
Uh, I did my best, and I'm wow. sorry if I didn't get to all the questions. Um, I would just ask uh, as a favor to all of you, since you're all here, you might have an interest. Um, I did recently launch the Thriving podcast. Um, it's called Thriving yeah. Breakthrough Movement. And of course, I'd love for you to listen, but, and we kicked off with John Elkington. So, uh, you know, that was great. But more than that, I would love your suggestions on who you think I should also wow. be inviting, because I'm very conscious that for this to work, for us to create a thriving future, it has to become a movement. And that means getting everybody's voice that is important out there. I'm especially aware and concerned that we are often, as we discussed, underrepresenting diverse voices, especially from the global south, but also in terms of gender, ethnicity, culture, and so on. So if you have people that you think are in this space, and this could be related to any of the six transitions, um, that you think I should invite as a guest, then please uh, do get in touch and I'll, I'll reach out to them. Brilliant. Yes, um, I've, I've got ideas, so I've, but we'll, we'll catch up after this and um, definitely send you a couple. So thank you so much. And by the way, I, I think you did enough with the examples. People could read the book. I would recommend everybody reading the book and, and just marking up um, the examples that are most relevant and interesting to you because there's lots and lots of them and lots of little explanations of things that you may or may not already understand. Great. Well, thanks so much. And thank you all for your interest and for being here and for being part of the thriving movement. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye for now.